Hallelujah. It feels good in the presence of the Lord tonight. Amen. Why don't you just greet somebody as you make your way to your seats tonight? It is so wonderful to see everybody in church on a Wednesday night. church. Let's get ready to praise God in this place tonight. Oh, Jesus, we worship you. Wonderful, wonderful, Jesus is to me.
Let's lift our hands and worship him in this place tonight. We serve a good God and he's worthy of our praise. coming together with the family of God, getting in the presence of the Lord. And as Sister Kerrigan began to sing, I felt such an anointing settle in this room. And we don't always do this on Wednesday nights, but if you have a special need in your life or in your body, if you'd just like to step up, we'll have the brothers and sisters gather around and pray for you right now. I don't want to pass this moment by, but I feel like God has a special touch for this church body tonight. Amen. Thank you to you brothers who are having the courage to come. I wonder if some brothers could gather around these men, if there's any sisters that come. Just be sensitive. Sister Kerrigan, go ahead and sing that again. As Sister Kerrigan sings that, why don't you just let the Holy Ghost move 
our midst tonight. Hallelujah. I wonder if there's some ladies that can come pray for Sister Savannah as she stands in the stead of her mom. to do something right now would you speak a word of encouragement to your brother or your sister I, I just believe that there are some that coming to the house of God tonight it was all you could do to make it but I feel an uplift of the Holy Ghost in this room right now why don't you just take two or three minutes and just speak a word of encouragement maybe just smiling will be more than enough Maybe it's a compliment. Maybe the person you're speaking to might not have heard a positive word all week, but they might get it right now.
May the Lord bless you as our ushers come and you make your way back to your seats. And I want to take this moment and commend all of you who worked hard all day but made it to the house of the Lord. And thank you for being faithful. And I believe that because you're here, there's a special touch and there's a special blessing that is upon you. Amen. What an amazing weekend we had. Saturday night, uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night. Saturday night was very, very powerful. Brother Doug Swart told me, he said, I was sitting at my desk in Modesto and I felt like the Lord prompted me to go to Kerman. And he walked in with a word from heaven. And we didn't know he was coming, but God knew he was coming and he knew what we needed. And then Sunday morning, there was a special touch. Sunday night, Brother Elias Navarres did a wonderful job preaching a very timely word to our young people. And we had a, an amazing deep move of the Holy Ghost. And I believe it was all to prepare us for tonight. I've lived my whole life to get to this day. That means everything leading up to this day was to prepare me for tonight. So I don't want to waste tonight. I don't want tonight to pass me by, and I don't want to pass tonight by, but I want to have an encounter with God. Is that your desire? Amen. Amen. Jesus, I thank you for your hand of blessing that is upon your people. Thank you for spiritual blessings that are present in this church body. I thank you for your financial provision. God, you've done so much, and we just want to say thank you. We thank you for your hand of protection on our kids. We thank you, God, for your hand of guidance on every decision and on our future as a church and as families and as individuals. I pray tonight that you will minister a healing touch to all of those who are sick in body and to those who are traveling, that you would keep your hand upon them. And I pray over this giving tonight. Lord, that your blessing would be upon it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you as you come and give tonight. And as you are coming to give, I want to uh, let you know that this Sunday night, we will not be having our normally scheduled Sunday night service, but our young people are going to have their youth Christmas party. And so I wanted to make all of you aware of that. We have some who are not in the youth group who come on Sunday nights. And uh, if you come this Sunday night, it won't be prayer. You'll be, you'll be crashing the youth Christmas party. And so uh, we, we do have a special Christmas schedule. We'll announce more about that on Sunday. And uh, right now we just want to dismiss our children. Tonight the young people are going to be staying in. We have Brother and Sister Ellis that have come to be with us tonight. We're excited to have them. Very, very excited. And I want to encourage you, stay in tune with Jesus throughout the holidays. Don't get carnal for Christmas. That's not the gift that we want to give the Lord. Christmas is a time that we have chosen to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, and so we want to keep Him central to everything that we do this year. And so enjoy your family, buy the kids some Christmas gifts, enjoy decorating the tree and drinking a little hot chocolate, gain three pounds if you must, if we could just shut those back doors before we all freeze out tonight. It's beginning to feel a lot like Christmas. Amen. But whatever we do, let's stay in tune with Jesus. Let's stay in the Holy Ghost throughout this year. How many are going to wave your hand and say, I'm going to make an extra special effort just to keep on walking close to the altar and living near to Jesus? Amen. Amen. I felt like the Lord directed me to invite Brother and Sister Ellis. I told Brother Ellis, I said, but Ellis, we love when you come, but I'd really love if you could bring the whole family. And so we're happy tonight to have Camilla, Heidi, Leo, and Theo, and brother and sister Ellis are here. And I believe that brother Ellis has a word from the Lord. He's just...
kind of part of our extended church family. And for a while there, he was preaching when I was gone. And um, most of you probably don't know this, but most visiting or guest preachers prefer that the pastor be there. It's easier to preach if the pastor's there. But then the pastor wants to have somebody who can handle it when he's gone, that he trusts. And so it's a it's kind of an honor. Even though you don't like doing it, preaching without the pastor there, it's kind of an honor because you trust him. And so for a while there, Pentecostal Tabernacle, Brother Ellis was my go-to, that when I was out and when one of our local brothers weren't preaching, who we trust, all of them in the pulpit, but, well, maybe one or two. that we. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We don't want to stir anything up bad on Wednesday night. But we would have Brother Ellis because God has a special touch and an anointing upon his life and Sister Ellis's life. They're doing an incredible job uh, leading the uh, hyphen group Lifeline in CLC. He is the college campus pastor, and he does about 45 other things, and he does them all well. They do them with an anointing, and I'm pleased to announce to you tonight that Brother Ellis is going to be one of the speakers at our School of the Prophets that's coming up in March. And so we're excited about that. Brother Ellis, come minister what the Lord has laid on your heart for Pentecostal Tabernacle tonight. Praise the Lord, saints. How many feel good in the house of God tonight? Amen. How many can feel Jesus? I feel the presence of God. As the moment I walk in, some churches you have to go to and you have to warm up the Spirit of God. Other churches you go to, you feel as if God is there waiting for His saints to come. Amen. There's something about faithful saints with faithful expectation. Every time I come to Pentecostal Tabernacle, this is my first time in this remodeled building, and I have to say, it looks absolutely wonderful. It looks great. Praise God. And... Uh, Amen. And uh, I am in wonder that at one time this was a Presbyterian church, Methodist church, amen, and uh, it was full of dead, dry religion. But then the Pentecostals of Kerman, Pentecostal Tabernacle, and I, you know, it just reminds you that it's not about a building, but it's about the people that bring the Spirit into the building. Amen. Let it be a lesson that you can have a move of God anywhere you go. Amen. I give honor to your pastor tonight, my very, very dear friend. Um, I feel greatly intimidated by that introduction. Amen. Because I feel like I have to try to live up to it. Amen. But I feel very comfortable here tonight. Um, I know that I'm in the will of God. I have a word from God. Um, as many of you know, Brother Andre had me for four years. I, I do teach at the Bible College. I see Brother Brandon Castillo. I had him for some classes, I think, something, you know. And um, I don't know if he was there or not, you know. I'm just, I'm just playing. But Brother Brandon, I give honor to him. And uh, Brother Corbin, who I don't see here tonight, but had, had him in classes. So I feel very, very comfortable teaching. It's a flow that I'm in quite a bit. And uh, I feel very, very strong. The Lord gave me a word to teach tonight. So I'll be in a complete teaching vain tonight. I may not even raise my voice. Wouldn't that be something? Amen. In a Pentecostal church service. I don't think I can. No. I already know I can't, but I just wanted to say that to get your guard down, you know. Uh, but I'm just going to teach tonight. It's going to be uh, a Bible study, but I'm not just teaching uh, because uh, that's just something I want to do. I genuinely feel the Holy Ghost leading me to teach on this subject tonight. I have so many scriptures I won't even read all of them, but for you note takers that would want to dive into this a bit deeper, I will do, uh, I'll reference a lot of scriptures. I have quite a bit of scriptures tonight. We're just going to take a journey through the word of God. And if you have your Bibles ready, keep them ready, keep them open. Uh, we're going to take a journey, and, but I will be uh, respectful of your time. As Pastor Sanders mentioned, many of you worked full days. I worked um, bivocational ministry for five years I worked a sales job over 40 hours, sometimes up to 70 hours a week, and then had to rush uh, a one and a half hour commute back to church, and then 
go into the church service and do all that. So I honor you tonight. Uh, what time? I don't see a clock. Amen. Is there a clock anywhere near here? That's what I thought. Amen. <laughs> Amen. When a man of God is in the unction, he doesn't want to see a clock, you know. And I know this is not a church that is bound by a clock. Amen. But I just want to let you know that I do respect all of your time tonight, but I do feel that I have a word from God. Um, I've never taught, I'm telling Brother Andre, I've never taught on this before. I feel that this was specifically downloaded in my spirit for this service tonight. Amen. Um, and so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book, the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to read two verses, verses 20 and 21. As soon as you find that, uh, get your best saving finger and put it in there and turn to James 5.16. And then we're going to read that, and uh, then we'll be seated. 2 Timothy 2, when you have that, would you say amen? amen? Okay, most of you have it, so I'm going to read it. I don't know if we, have, we don't have a projector tonight, so everyone, oh, we do, right over there. Okay, like I said, I feel very comfortable tonight. Um, I, I love being here. If home away from home was ever a true statement, this is my home away from home. I love so many of you so very much. How many love your pastor tonight? Yes. Amen. Love him very much. Glad my family's here. Amen. Praise God. I've delayed you long enough. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20 through 21. But in a great house, look at your neighbor and say a great house. And I want you to take note of that word in. Everything we're about to read about are things that are inside of the house. There are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth. Some to honor and some to dishonor. Uh, God uses all types of vessels. He doesn't just use one type of vessel. And just because somebody is being used does not mean they are being used in an honorable way. I don't want to be a vessel of dishonor tonight. I don't want to be a vessel that God uses but doesn't want me to remain in his house after he's done using me. Verse 21, therefore, if a man, if a man therefore purge himself from these sins, uh, if you look at the context, these are sins of the tongue uh, that lead to more ungodliness and gossip and arguing and those types of things, if you read 2 Timothy 2. Uh, if he purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared Unto every good work. James 5, 16. I'm only going to read the second half of the verse. It's the more familiar part of the verse. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man. Turn to your neighbor and say, a righteous man. Availeth much. Tonight, I'm going to teach on this subject. The anatomy of a righteous man. The anatomy of a righteous man. Last time I was... I taught here, I taught about on the anatomy of a backslider. I don't know why God has me teaching anatomy every time I'm here, but I got the title before I remembered that fact, and so I do believe uh, there's something there tonight. Would you put your Bibles down and just lift your hands to heaven? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the Holy Ghost that is already here. Lord, you put your word even above your own name, so Father, there's nothing more powerful than the word of God tonight. I allow the word of God to do the heavy lifting as I try to convey these concepts and truths and scriptures. Lord, help us to leave here stronger than what we came. Help us to leave more equipped, God, to serve, more equipped to walk, more equipped to live. God, that we would have tools in which would help us to live overcoming lives for you, Lord. I know that it is your will that we live for you according to knowledge and to wisdom, Lord. So we apply ourselves to doctrines and exhortations and teachings tonight, Lord. We love you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. 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 You could be seated tonight. Uh, there is hardly a more biblical word in all of the English language than that of righteousness. Having grown up in church, it was a word that I have heard all of my life. And it was one of those words that you had somewhat of a feeling of what it might have meant. But it, what you weren't really quite sure of its full definition. So I'm going to try to explain that to you tonight. The Greek word is dikaios. Its simplest meaning, so word righteous in uh, the Greek, the original language of the Bible, 
And its simplest definition means to be correct or by implication, innocent. A more theological definition is the conformity of God's standard of what is right. In other words, righteousness is doing what God thinks is the right thing to do in every and in any scenario. Uh, but if the child in me was here to confess to you today, he would say that he did not give much thought to the attainment of righteousness, chiefly because of certain verses that are underinterpreted. The book of Romans chapter 3 verse 10, it's a verse that we can probably all quote. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And so at first glance, it might appear that righteousness is an unattainable thing in the kingdom of God. And there are many charismatic and denominal people that take this side. It is impossible for us to become righteous in any way. And, and they go on uh, about their doctrines that I won't elaborate on here tonight. But having a proper understanding of theology, or an under, in other words, having good sound teaching is imperative to your walk with God and your understanding of the word of God. That's why I believe that we should not just show up to Sunday morning preaching, but we need to show up to Wednesday evening Bible study. Uh, preaching conferences where people get up and talk about all of the benefits of the Word of God and encourage you to read the Word of God and encourage you to live a consistent life walking with God. We uh, have those by the thousands and generally there are no seats left in the building. But when it's time to teach the Word of God, it's like pulling teeth to try to get them in the building. And so coming and hearing your man of God, there is few men of God that are more effective Effective at teaching practical biblical doctrines than the pastor that occupies this pulpit every single week. And so uh, I, I know I don't need to tell it to you tonight, but if you need to nudge somebody that you know, encourage somebody to come and to hear the teached word of God. Because verses like Romans chapter 3 can be detrimental to somebody's walk with God if they do not properly understand it. I do not read Romans chapter 3 when, they say, when it says, there is no righteous, no, not one. And my reflection on that verse should not be, well, that means that I don't need to be concerned with the way that I live. That is absolutely not the case and is not what the scripture is teaching. And so, <clears throat> again, uh, the 9 or 10-year-old boy thought this way at one point in my life. Why concern yourself? with the topic of righteousness if no one has ever been able to attain it. And so the truth is, if you understand the context of the book of Romans, and that is an entirely different lesson, but there is a flow to the book of Romans. And what uh, the apostle Paul is trying to do is in Romans chapter 1, he addresses, uh, the book of Romans is really the doctrine of salvation from A to Z. And he addresses every point of salvation uh, for the life of a believer in the book of Romans. Paul, that's what the book is all about. Because there were Jewish Christians and there were Gentile Christians. And they were contending about disputable matters. And so Paul lays out all the essential doctrines. In chapter 1, he talks about conscience and how conscience was an unable method for man to reach God. In chapter 2, he starts to talk about the law, but the law was insufficient. And in chapter 3, he basically says that there's never been anybody that has been able to achieve salvation through the means of righteousness alone. What am I saying? He's saying that uh, there is a standard in which it is required to enter into heaven. God is a righteous God. How many knows that God is not tolerable of sin at all? 
God is not tolerable of any sin whatsoever. God is long-suffering towards sin, but he is not tolerable of sin. He is a holy God, and one sin is enough to send one person into hell for eternity. It only takes one slip of the tongue. It only takes one bad thought. How many know that the Bible teaches that thoughts of your hearts can be sin? And if that's the case, nobody has a chance whatsoever. I don't care who you are, Mother Teresa. I don't care who you are. You've never lived. I know some of you think you have, amen. Or some people think they have. Nobody here, amen. Um, this is not one of those places. You know? <laughs> Sister Teresa, she's here. Are you a mother? Are you a mother? Mother Teresa, amen. <laughs> Praise God. I told you, I'm just comfortable here tonight, all right? You'll see a different side of me at the School of the Prophets, okay? You'll see the growly side of me. But this, if, you want, if you're a young person and you want to go to Bible college, ask for the Andre. This is how I am in the classroom. I like to joke. I like to have a good time. But most importantly, I want to study the Word of God. Um, and so uh, God is a holy God, and he's a righteous God, and heaven is a pure place. There will not be one sin that is allowed into heaven. This is why even the Old Testament saints were not allowed access into heaven. They were allowed access into a place called Abraham's bosom. This is what it talks about when we read the fivefold ministry passage uh, in Ephesians chapter 4. The Bible said that he first descended and he took captivity captive. What that's saying is he took the Old Testament saints. So the work of the cross did not just go forwards, but it actually went backwards to those who had faith in the Old Testament. And so that group of people that were not able to access heaven, why? Because their sins were pardoned, but their sins were not remitted. Let me explain the difference. In the Old Testament, sin was pardoned. What that means is, yes, you committed the sin, but I'm not going to require the consequence of that sin. But the remission of sin is when God takes your sin and he wipes the slate clean. As if you had never committed the sin in the first place. And if you wonder if baptism in Jesus' name is essential to get into heaven, I invite you to turn to the book of Acts chapter 238 when the, the apostle Peter said you need to be baptized for the remission of sin. Meaning you are only pardoned from sin, but you are not remitted from sin until you are baptized in Jesus' name. Baptism is not just an outer expression of an inward work. It is the removal and the remission and the blotting out as if it never happened before. The theological word for this is justification. And we are justified by faith. And so to tie it back into this, there is no person that has ever lived a pure enough life to be able to go into heaven by their own volition. We needed a savior. We needed the blood. The blood purchased my sin and washed me whiter than snow that's why i love singing about the blood that's why all these new age songs they don't like to sing about the blood because the blood is gory there's death involved it, it's not sinner friendly but i want to tell you tonight that i am thankful for the blood of jesus paul said in titus not by works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy, he has saved us uh, th through the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Ghost. Uh, I didn't earn salvation. Uh, I didn't earn my way into heaven. Uh, but thank God for that washing. Uh, and thank God for that Holy Ghost uh, that remitted me of all my sin. And so uh, Romans chapter 3 is reversing to, excuse me, it is referring to heaven's standard of righteousness however that does not mean that god does not judge men according to the level of revelation he has given them and that standard of righteousness there is a separate standard of righteous righteousness apart from the standard of the heavenly one and i'm going to explain that to you in fact the bible calls quite a few men righteous 
So if you don't understand that there are two standards in which the Bible refers to as righteousness, this would be a seemingly an apparent contradiction. But the Bible calls many men righteous, and in some cases to go even further to call them perfect. I'm, not, I'm talking about people in addition to the man Christ Jesus. Did you know that in your Bible, there are three men in the Old Testament that God refers to as perfect? And so we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight and uh, how, to, how to handle that and how to understand that. Uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. Uh, I'm, not going to do, I'm not going to wait for you to turn there because I have quite a few of these, but you could take notes. And if the media team has got lightning fingers, if you could keep up with me, that would be great. Uh, these are the generation of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Genesis, Genesis 17, 1. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Job 1 and 1. We're going to come back to Job 1 and 1 at the end of our lesson tonight. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And then Jesus, uh, you ever reading through the Beatitudes, when you come to this verse, I have to be honest, my stomach always sinks a little bit inside of my body when I read this verse. Matthew 5, 48. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. So it doesn't make any sense to interpret Romans chapter 3 and to say it doesn't matter how you live. It matters very much how you and I live. And so these verses can be a bit hard to swallow at first. I'm going to do my best to try to explain them. Perfect here uh, in the original language, both in the Hebrew and the Greek, does not mean flawless. It does not mean that these men had never made a single mistake in their entire life. In fact, the Greek word is telos. It means, it's a word that has a wide range of meanings, but I'm going to explain a few of them here tonight. It means complete, having reached its end, or I like this one, complete in all of its parts. In other words, these, men's were, these men were able to be called perfect, because they demonstrated completeness in using the tools and giftings that God provided to them in their particular dispensation. And so you have to understand that uh, a, a study of dispensationalism is very, very, very important to a proper understanding in the word of God. That revelation is progressively revealed throughout scripture and is manifested in Jesus Christ. You can see these progressive doctrines. Every major doctrine in the Bible can be found in the book of Genesis. And they start to unfold throughout the scripture. But in these older dispensation, they were not given full revelation. And something that you need to note is that all three of these men... Noah, Abraham, and Job all existed before the institution of the law of Moses. After the law of Moses was given, no other man other than Jesus Christ was ever called perfect again. And so under their dispensations, you have to understand that Noah lived in the dispensation of conscience, meaning you live according to God to what you see best in your own eyes and that was the only tool he was given uh, Noah was given no Bible Noah didn't have a pastor Noah didn't have a church or a community he was just a single man that walked with God and according to the revelation that Noah was given he maximized the potential of that revelation in that dispensation and so God said build me an ark so Noah built an ark and by Noah building an ark, God said, you have done everything that I've asked you to do, therefore you are perfect. Under the dispensation of promise, Abraham was required, come out from your land, the Ur of the Chaldees, and go to a land in which I will show you. 
That was step number one. The second step is he says, I'm going to make an everlasting covenant with you. And what I'm going to require of you is that you circumcise your children on the eighth day. And Abraham did those two things. He left out of his land and he went and pursued the land of God uh, the promised land that he had for him and he circumcised his children so perfection in the Old Testament was nothing more than doing everything that God asked you to do it wasn't that these men didn't have any sins it wasn't that these men didn't have any flaws but God said I'll look past your flaws I'll look past your weaknesses and I'm going to judge your character according to how you handle the things I've given you and the things I've asked you to do. God's not asking anybody to be perfect by an American standard. God is not looking for anybody to never make a mistake and never have a bad thought. We understand that uh, the standard of heaven was made for us, but he is asking for his people to live according to a standard where they can stand before God and say, God, I've done everything that you've asked me to do. I have been faithful, I have been a faithful steward of the giftings you have given me. And that was the Old Testament standard of being perfect. But as the law came about, there were 613 commandments that were given. So the new standard of perfection would be to obey all 613 commandments. But of course, no one was ever able to do this. So no one, as revelation progresses, perfection is harder to achieve. But under the law, there were still men that were counted as righteous. Abel in Hebrews 11.4 was called righteous. Joseph, the stepfather of Jesus in Matthew 1.19 was called Jesus. Zechariah and Elizabeth, man and woman, parents of John the Baptist in Luke 1 and 5 were called righteous. John the Baptist, Cornelius, Simon were all called righteous. These were not perfect men. But there is one man that I want to highlight to you tonight. And I have a capitulation to the end of this lesson that I ultimately do believe is going to help you in your walk with God. I'm just laying a little bit of a foundation. Is that all right? All right. Second Peter chapter 2. If your neighbor's falling asleep, just give him an elbow in the ribs real quick. All right. Just checking. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 6. We're going to read verses 6 through 8. This is one of the more interesting and complicated passages in the entire Bible. When you have it, would you say amen? And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. In verse 7, and delivered righteous Lot who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his soul from day to day, seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. And so if you understand anything about Lot, how could you say that he was a righteous man? Lot was the man that lived in the wicked city. He was the man that was asked to give a portion of, his, uh, of the sheep to his uncle Abraham, but, but he kept it for himself. And while he was in the city, there was all kinds of evil befalling him. And the, the angels came to his house and they visited with him. And the homosexual uh, community of Sodom and Gomorrah tried to beat down the door and tried to come in and rape the, the men that were there. And Lot says, well, no, don't rape my guests. Why don't you take my daughters instead? How could you consider somebody like that righteous? But we have to address this. In 2 Peter, the Bible refers to him as a righteous man. And so you have to understand that generally we characterize people by their worst moments. This was not a good moment in Lot's life. Lot had a series of very poor moments and very poor decisions. But the scriptures say, yes, that was a bad moment, but I don't judge the character of Lot by his worst moments. And this is a, a narrative that gets me so angry when it comes to the teenage age, when there's somebody that puts on and they get up and uh, they, they put on a good presentation, and there's somebody in the crowd that leans over, and Brother Brad, you're probably familiar with this, and says, oh yeah, yeah, they might be all spiritual standing up there, but I know the real them. And as, hum and as humans, we don't characterize people by their best moments. We define people by their worst moments. 
and I saw what they did that one time. Who gives me the right to judge someone's character by their worst moments? Lot had a terrible moment of judgment. He had several terrible moments of judgment. And they didn't stop there. He didn't train his wife well enough. And when they were leaving Sodom and Gomorrah, she turned back and turned into a, into a pillar of salt. And then he didn't teach his daughters well enough. And later, they're up in the, uh, uh, the caves of Moab. and uh, It's not Moab quite yet. They turned to the Moabites. They're up in the caves somewhere. And because of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, they genuinely thought they were the last people on earth. So they get their dad drunk with wine and they try to repopulate the earth using their father and this is where the Moabites come from where they are sick and messed up people so Lot did not have a perfect life Lot did not make all the right decisions he had some skeletons in his closet but day by day he saw the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah and he never got comfortable with the wickedness and he not never got comfortable with the sin of the world his heart was yes I make mistakes yes I'm not perfect but my heart is to please the Lord and the Bible says that wickedness vexed his righteous soul. So I've, I've come to just break uh, the myth tonight that just because the Bible says there's no one that has obtained the righteousness of heaven does not mean that God does not want you to obtain a righteous life while living on this earth. It's very important how you and I live. It's very important. Amen? Uh, and so I, I want to talk about this tonight. And and I believe it's very important. And there's a verse that we can all quote. Uh, we could probably quote it uh, without even my assistance tonight. It says, for a righteous man falleth seven times, but he rises again. But the wicked shall fall by calamity. Now the reason, now I might get a little excited at this point because God was touching me with this. And I've received great uh, uh, comfort from this understanding over the last couple of days. It's very significant what's going on in this verse. Okay, the Bible says a righteous man falls seven times. Let me explain why that's significant. Uh, this is not the usual formula that scripture uses to describe this type of event. Now, I'm not a believer in numerology. I don't believe, there are some people that believe every number in the Bible has some type of deep mystical meaning and sometimes there's hidden correlations behind the numbers i'm not a big believer in all of that but if you do understand hebrew thought certain numbers definitely have significance and let me explain the usual formula to you in job chapter 5 verse 19 uh, job is receiving a, a sermon from one of his friends eliphaz and eliphaz says he shall deliver thee in six troubles yea in seven there shall no evil touch you. Now, Eliphaz is not saying that righteous people are only going to experience exactly six troubles in their life. That's not what he's trying to explain. What he's saying is six is the number of imperfect man. Six is the number of man. We were created on the sixth day. The mark of the beast is 666. What he is saying is uh, when you've done all you can do, you're going to experience calamity. But when God steps in the seventh time, he's going to deliver you. What he's saying is when you have done everything that you can do and the number of man is completed, the number of God steps in and he's going to deliver you out of your problems. He's saying that God comes in and fills the gaps. When you've done everything possible and you've toiled and toiled and, and everything seems to be going wrong and you've paid your tithes and you've been consistent and faithful and you've been a faithful steward at the end of the day God steps in and does what only God can do and so that's the usual formula uh, something about six times and then the seventh time God comes in because seven is God's number of completion it was the day he created the world he, he rested on the seventh day and so on and so forth uh, another familiar passage of scripture in Proverbs chapter 6 verse 16 through 19 it says these six things doth the Lord hate Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Now, these are not a full, complete list of abominations in the Bible. There are over 60 times abominations are mentioned in the scripture. What is an abomination? An abomination is something that is so heinous and something that is so sick 
you can, uh, it, the Bible gives us somewhat of image that it, it almost makes God want to vomit. It's just so sick. It's not something that he hates. It turns his stomach. And, and, and so it's not that these are all the abominations in the scripture, but this is all the sins that you can commit against your brother. If you look at all of the other uh, abominations, they're generally things that are unilateral, things that are connected just between you and God. But these are the seven sins that you can commit against your neighbor. And so what the Bible says is if you commit six of these sins, that's bad. But if you commit the seventh sin, you have passed beyond uh, uh, the conviction of God and you've entered into an area where you have totally defamed your brother. You've gone... You've gone beyond human limitation, and you've stepped into an area of completeness, okay? So do we understand that formula, six and then seven? We understand that. The Bible says that a righteous man falleth seven times. Let me explain to you what that means tonight. It should say, it, it, with our human understanding, that he falls six times, but then he gets up a seventh time. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says he falls seven times, meaning he falls down the perfect, complete amount of times. His falling is total. His falling is complete. His falling is final. His falling has, uh, there's no hope. Uh, he, he, he's gone to the very end of falling. He couldn't fall anymore, yet he gets up one more time and God says when all the odds are stacked against a righteous man and he makes mistake after mistake after mistake a righteous man falls but what is characteristic of a righteous man is not falling it's prophesied he's going to fall it's prophesied he's going to make a mistake but it's also prophesied that he's going to get up one more time so let me preach a little bit about what it means to be righteous a righteous man doesn't mean that you don't make a mistake a righteous man doesn't mean that you're flawless a righteous man says I'm not giving up I'm going to keep trying until I get this thing right I hadn't figured out prayer yet but I'm gonna keep praying I haven't figured out fasting yet but I'm gonna keep fasting I haven't learned how to be a good husband or a good wife yet but a righteous man says I'm not giving up I don't care how bad it looks I don't care how final it seems I'm getting up again. Woo, I feel the Holy Ghost. Would you just lift your hands right now? Hallelujah. Brother Brad, why don't we close this down? You give me some music. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Uh, I've been teaching this Bible study for 30, 45 minutes just to tell somebody that God, it's not God's uh, uh, will that you throw yourself in the deplorable basket, in the throwaway basket, just because you haven't figured everything out yet. Righteousness in scripture, as far as God calling, I mean, if Lot was called a righteous man, and all the mistakes that he made, God does not judge us according to a standard of flawlessness. I'm going to tell you what I believe the standard is of righteousness. And I think it's encapsulated in Job 1.1. And I'm going to tie this back into the verse we just read. I'm going to read it again. There was a man in us whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright. And I believe it defines his perfection and his, his righteousness. One that feared God and eschewed evil. The word eschewed, it's, a, it's an old English word, just means avoided. Meaning, it was always his intention to avoid evil things. It was always his intention to make sure that his heart was guarded. It was always his intention to make sure he was never in compromising situations. Even when his children were feasting and drinking wine, the Bible says that he offered sacrifice to the Lord just in case his children would have blasphemed God in their heart. It wasn't that Job was flawless. If you, if you read the transcription of his, 
of his suffering. There was a lot of flaws and a lot of bad emotions and a lot of bad feelings that were stored up in the, in the heart of Job. Job definitely loved money a little too much. And Job was definitely really, really proud of how rich he was. And, and there was things that was bound up in his heart. But the Bible didn't say he was righteous because he had no flaws. The Bible said he was righteous because his heart was always to do the will of God. It was always his intention when he woke up every day. Today, I'm going to please the Lord. A righteous man doesn't just serve God on Sunday. A righteous man doesn't just clean his life up the day before he has to minister. A righteous man lives for God whether if nobody ever sees this if nobody ever notices this it's not that righteous people don't make mistakes righteous people do make mistakes but the formula is my heart is to serve you hezekiah was a man that made lots of mistakes hezekiah we can go through he he bragged on the gold to the king of babylon and he sold um he sold the riches of the temple to the assyrians and and Hezekiah did a lot of good, but he made some big mistakes. But while he's praying, and uh, he, he's prophesied that he's going to die, and Isaiah tells him, and, and he, he gets on his knees. And I, this is there, is, there is power when you set your heart towards righteousness. He said, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I've walked before thee in truth with a perfect heart. And have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. Hezekiah never said, I never made any mistakes. I feel the Holy Ghost sweeping in this building right now. Hezekiah never said, I never made any mistakes. Hezekiah said, Lord, I made mistakes. But it was always my intention to serve you. Those moments were bad moments. And so, back to our, our passage in Proverbs where it says... A righteous man falls seven times. Read the context of that. It's talking about when calamity comes. It's talking about calamity falling righteous people and unrighteous people. And the righteous people always seem to make it. And the unrighteous people always seem to not make it. Read the whole context of the passage. So what it's saying is that when calamity comes. So it, it's not saying that a righteous man is going to be on his couch scrolling through Instagram all day and then he falls. That's not a righteous man. A righteous man is when calamity happens and you know like your house burn, burns down or your kid dies or there's no money in the bank account and you get sued for no reason so you lose your job something terrible happens it's going to be in those moments those bad moments where life was harder than we thought it was supposed to be that we make mistakes even righteous people in their worst moments are going to make mistakes but the fact is that they're going to get up one more time and so to be a righteous person, you've got to throw this idea that it's about perfection. It's about setting your heart. I'm going to please you today. That is righteousness in the sight of God. Today, my day is dedicated to serving you. And along the way, something happened and I fell down. And I pray like Hezekiah, Lord, you know I didn't... That wasn't in my heart to do. It was a bad moment. I need you to forgive me for that bad moment. But I'm going to keep going. Let me tell you, there's a difference. I just feel this in the Holy Ghost. I didn't have this in, I didn't prepare this, but I feel it in the Holy Ghost. There's a difference between repentance and confession. And you need to understand that difference. Repentance is making an about face. Repentance means you're going the wrong way. So you turn around and go the right way. And some of you will need to repent tonight. Because it hasn't been your intention to solely serve the Lord. It's been your intention to do the half and half or whatever. And that's, we all, we've all been there. But tonight, you might have to repent and say, no, I, I hear the words of the preacher. I feel the conviction of the Holy Ghost. I am turning totally towards the Lord. Repentance is necessary. I still have to repent. But I've heard that there's this doctrine that you have to repent every single day. And I think the essence of that is true. But I do not have to turn my path every single day. 
We're not spiritual helicopters. I'm not changing. I, my heart is set towards the Lord every day. It doesn't mean that I don't make mistakes, but every day it's my intention to serve the Lord. But the book of 1 John says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Sometimes you fall down when you're going the right way. And you have to confess, Lord, I don't need to repent. I'm going the right way. My, it's all about the state of your heart. Righteousness isn't about perfection of everything. It's about the state of your heart. And the final point I want to give tonight is there are benefits of a man or a woman that will set their heart to live righteous, to please God. I don't do this so pastor can see me. I don't do this so I'm qualified for pulpit ministry. I don't do this so Brother Brad will ask me to teach a Bible study. I do this because I want to please him. And hear me right now. I feel this so strong. I feel a prophetic anointing just hit me right now. There's two elements to righteousness. Wanting to do what is right and hating that which is evil. The first element of degrading a standard of righteousness. The Bible says Lot remained righteous because he still kept hating evil. Why was he righteous? Because he still hated evil. He made mistakes, but he still wanted to please God, and he still hated evil. We can't ever come to a place where, yes, we are encompassed and surrounded and engulfed with wickedness to the point where we ever become comfortable with wickedness and evil in our homes. And I feel in the Holy Ghost, and I, I feel in the Holy Ghost right now, somebody's got to have a Josiah moment when they go home tonight and say, Lord, I've let, it, I've let too many things pile up in my home. I've let too many things, and it's degrading my standard of righteousness. Shows that it didn't used to bother me before, or used to bother me before, don't bother me before. Jokes about homosexuality, swearing, it doesn't bother me anymore. It used to make my spirit cringe, but it doesn't anymore. But God is saying, it's not about perfection, but what is the state of your heart? Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day, not on Sunday, day and night. His tree shall be planted by the rivers of waters, and he shall bear fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like a chaff, which the wind driveth away. Therefore sinners shall not stand in judgment, or the ungodly in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. The text I open with tonight, the effectual, fervent prayer. I believe in fervent praying. I believe apostolic praying is the way to do it. 
I think praying with fire. I think that word fervent means to boil over. I think we should pray like it, like we're a, a, a pot of water boiling over. I don't believe in lay me down to sleep. I don't believe in just prayers under your breath. I believe there should be prayers where you can feel the fire of the Holy Ghost. You can feel it overwhelming. The way Brother Charlie prays when the Holy Ghost hits him. I believe in that kind of praying. I believe it's the right way to pray. I think we need to pray fervently. We need to pray effectually. We need to pray according to the will of God. Don't just throw random prayers and shotgun them. Get in this word and say, God, how do you want me to pray? But there's one caveat. I can't just show up to prayer with passion according to the word of God, living however I wanted to live. Did you know that God, this, is, this might blow some of your minds, God does not answer prayers at the same rate for everybody? Did you know that? Did you know that he doesn't have like an auto, auto reply where he has to answer every prayer? Did you know? He does, oh thou that hearest prayer. We see him answering the prayers of ungodly people and, and unrighteous people and even demons in scripture. So God answers all kinds of prayer. What I'm talking about is the success rate of those prayers. The Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And then he goes into Elijah and said, Elijah was a man just like us, but he prayed that it wouldn't rain. And one righteous man was able to affect the lives of thousands and maybe millions of people because they didn't get any rain for three and a half years because a righteous man said it wouldn't rain. But then a righteous man said it would rain again and millions of people were affected. It pays to live righteous. Would you lift your hands right now? I'm done. Hallelujah. I don't know how you guys do it on Wednesday Bible study here, but at our church, uh, and I feel very comfortable doing this tonight, we just do what's called a family altar call. And we just, I'm going to invite every person in the building, if you want to come down to this altar right now, we're going to pray as a family because this is not something that applies to just one person. And this isn't just something that applies to someone who's living in Debat. This applies to every person. Lord, I'm going to set my heart towards righteousness. Lord, I'm going to set my heart to do that which is right. I might make mistakes along the way. I might fall along the way. I might not be perfect along the way. But it's always my intention to serve God. It's always my intention to serve Him. Hallelujah. If you feel comfortable, would you just put your arm around somebody? If you want to kneel by yourself, you can do that as well. But I'm going to ask everybody to come in close. Why don't you guys come in close to the people on the... The, hall, the aisles can come, come in close, come in close.
Hallelujah. I just want to direct your prayers uh, just very quickly. I don't ever want to stop a move of God, but I've learned in these types of environments, there can be a great amount of um, spiritual longing that comes out. God, I want to do this. God, I, I want to live the way you want me to live. And there's a tendency to come and, and, and express that emotion to God. But I want, to, I want to direct your prayers. In the book of Psalm 119, verse 40, the entire psalm is just peppered and covered with these types of, uh, of sayings. But this one was quickened into my spirit. It says, Behold, I have longed after thy precepts. Everything in me wants to do this. I long to live a life that is pleasing to you. He says, quicken me in thy righteousness. That word quicken is one of our favorite words in Pentecost. The word is revive. If there's ever revival I want to have, Lord, let it be a revival of righteousness. Not just a revival of excitement, not just a revival of a bunch of people coming inside the building, but a revival of righteousness. Revive me, Lord. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. This is not something you have to try to do on your own, but this is the prayer I, I'm inviting everybody to pray tonight. God, lead me, and whatever you ask me to do, I commit myself to do it. If we could all just close our eyes and just in your own way, would you express that to God? God, whatever you're asking me to do, I'm going to do it. Quicken me, revive me, open up my eyes, open up my spirit to righteousness. Remind me of convictions I used to have. Remind me of right things I used to think of. Remind me, Lord, of evils I used to hate. Remind me and revive me, oh Lord.
when Brother Ellis was <clears throat> referencing Hezekiah, I remembered a conversation that Charlie and I had probably a couple weeks ago. And he brought this portion of scripture to my attention. Second Chronicles 33:10. And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. They wouldn't listen. Manasseh is one of the most evil leaders in all of the history of the nation of Israel. Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria. They were so evil that God sent the Assyrian army against them which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God. Now in all of the teaching and preaching about Manasseh, sometimes we skip over this part right here. Manasseh humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. That's Hezekiah's righteousness rippling into Manasseh's life. Let me just tell you something. I'm not going to judge you and rejudge you and triple judge you by your greatest mistake. And God's not either. So quit doing it to yourself. Not only that, you know, when I see you, Brother Ramon Aguilera, all I can see in the last three or four days is you standing up here testifying in the Holy Ghost. I'm not thinking about the Ramon that walked through the door a couple years ago that life had given you a pretty rough road. I'm thinking about the Ramon under the anointing. What would happen... What would happen if we started looking at everybody through the lens of their high points? I think what would happen is we'd start lifting one another up with encouragement and we'd start living a little closer to those high points. Amen. When I think of David... When you think of David, we think of a lot of things, but what we teach about the most is he took down Goliath, man. That's the David I like. There's a lot of Davids in that scripture. There's one David, but there's a lot of sides of David. He had a lot of issues. But you know what? We look past all those issues and we say, he's the guy that took down Goliath. He's the greatest king in the history of Israel. And he's a man after God's own heart. He was falling on the path, but he got back up seven times. He just kept getting back up. Brother Israel, hey, I want you to remember your name every time you get up in the morning that there's promise. A prince that had power with God and man, and you have prevailed. It was a prophecy. It was a promise. God told that to Jacob. <laughs> Jacob was a mess. But God didn't look at him and see his mess. He looked at him and said, I'm going to speak promise over you. Brother Israel, when you look in the mirror, don't look at Jacob, but look and say, hey, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. What a message of mercy. What a word of encouragement in this house tonight. I, I think it's harder to get to hell than it is to get to heaven. I'm just saying. I know a lot more people go to hell, but it's because they're really trying to get there. But there's something inside of each and every one of you that it's just an upward pull. And I know it wars against the gravitational pull of your flesh trying to pull you towards earthly things, but count me on the Lord's side. I think you're going to get to heaven. 
God's prepared a way. He's pulling you as hard as He can. I'm reaching for you. Now the question is, what do you think? And if you can determine, I'm going to be that righteous man. I'm going to be that righteous lady that Brother Ellis talked about. Then, guess what? You're going to make it. You just keep showing up. Keep showing up to the presence of the Lord every morning. Keep being the man God called you to be. Keep being the lady God called you to be. And then when you pray, you know, I've always kind of looked at it this way, Brother Ellis, that it's righteousness that makes that prayer more fervent in the ears of God. I don't think you can be effectual without having that foundation of righteousness, just like Brother Ellis preached. But when we're trying to do our best in the eyes of God, then our prayers are going to be powerful. Did you know that even when your prayers are kind of weak in your ears, they're still powerful in heaven if you're righteous and you're doing your best living for God? Amen, amen. Brother Ellis, thank you for that word. You encouraged me so much tonight. On your way out, greet somebody. Let them know it's so, so good to see them. Hey, I want to say something that I haven't said enough, but I want to say two things. Number one, we're going to build a sanctuary seats, a thousand on that property over there. And <clears throat> number two, I want to say Merry Christmas. Amen. God bless you. Have a blessed week in Jesus' name.